plural society will challenge the status quo in evolutionary biology and also look at the uses or misuses of evolutionary theory in the social sciences and humanities. Is this the end of Darwin's era? And it raises the question, what's wrong with Darwin's theory today? So what is there really left of evolutionary theory to extend? How far could it be extended? When would it be too far extended? How far does one go till one gets an evolution of everything? An evolution of everything? Can everything evolve? What actually is it that's evolving? Is it a gene-centric view? Just genes, that's all that evolves? Or are there other things that evolve as well? Now there's talk about not only individual selection, selection at the level of the gene, but also group selection. And then, of course, some didn't want to have only one or the other, so now we have multi-level selection with both individual and group selection happening. Evolution is one type. You could say something evolves. You could say something emerges. You could say something arises. Then you also have talk about development. And development is the main topic of change in the human social sciences. As you can see, development is much more popular and more used than the term evolution. And in general, this comes back to the topic of origins and processes of change. What is the origin of change? And what are the processes that happen after the origin? These are different levels of explanation. So does that make evolution a rather empty term? Has it become more of an ideology now, rather than a legitimate and rigorous natural science when it's applied to the social sciences and humanities? Are we facing a problem not only in biology, but also in the social sciences and humanities? Did the United Nations make Millennial evolution goals? Why not? Why would you focus on development rather than evolution? It was for this reason that I wrote a book with the co-author on the topic of evolution's puzzle in the social sciences and humanities. And the reason for this was because change over time happens with different mechanisms. It happens with intentionality. It happens with purpose and aims and goals that we try to build things. It doesn't happen simply by the pressure of the environment and the individual doesn't have any choice at all. So the importance of the individual choice is central in the social sciences and humanities, in distinction from the natural sciences and humanities where evolution doesn't have a particular agent. So it raises the question of things that don't evolve. Once we have an answer to the question of things that don't evolve, we can draw limits and say some things are not evolutionary. Some people have said, well, rocks don't evolve. Some people say that's geological evolution or even cosmological evolution, that rocks also evolve. Some people have said mathematical theories don't evolve. They're there, they're beyond. But if someone's talking about the evolution of ideas or the evolution of science, one would have to involve and also include mathematical theories. Other people have said institutions don't evolve. They're human-made, they're intentional, they're planned. At the same time, there are others who say evolutionary economics is the new way to go. Even there's a new term, evonomics, the future of economics. And somehow, they want to go back to Darwin's ideas. For the 21st century, should we be using 19th century ideas in economics or other social sciences? When do we come to the point where there might be an overextension of evolution? When has evolution gone too far? When does the time come to say to biologists and other naturalists, keep your ideology to yourselves. This is not at the core of the social sciences and humanities. Then, however, we need to be looking at alternatives so that we don't just say evolutionary theory is not accurate, it's not adequate, it's not enough, we need something else also to come in and help us understand change over time in society and culture. We don't need zoologists pretending to be sociologists anymore. This is highly problematic when natural scientists act like they're the top of the great chain of scientific being and that social scientists and humanities can only talk about evolution or serious scientific topics as some kind of ethical add-on. At the same time, in the social sciences and humanities, we study change over time. We study groups, individuals, communities, 
societies interacting with each other at multiple levels already. So why are we being forced to use this terminology of evolution if there's better terminology to describe the change over time that happens in social sciences and humanities? Peace can be found for evolution's puzzle in the social sciences and humanities by letting go of ideologies like Darwinism or also young earth creationism. Why not instead embrace the new vocabulary and the new discoveries in science as they arise? The problem is the puzzle of evolution has become disfigured. It's become disproportionate. Certain voices are allowed to speak and certain others aren't. And even if they're allowed to speak, their voices are not heard when biologists are speaking as authorities over evolution. When the discussion becomes change over time, we have a new discourse. We now look at the topic of trans-evolutionary change, a neologism that's used to provide a new look at how change happens in societies. This is not a naturalistic theory of change over time. It's trans-evolutionary because it happens at different scales and in different ways than evolution in the biological sciences, in any of the natural sciences. For over a hundred years, scholars in the social sciences and humanities have used the term evolution in a rather loose way. Recently, however, there have been alternative ways to discuss change over time instead of using the topic of evolution. Since many scholars recognize that change happens differently in the social sciences and humanities than in the natural physical sciences. At the same time, there's a small group of activists in the social sciences and humanities who are trying to promote Darwin's ideas, universal Darwinism, generalized Darwinism, today in the social sciences and humanities. They say we should use biological ideas to understand people, communities, and groups. They don't want to let go of Darwin, and that's why there's a controversy that's being discussed at the Royal Society. Should we say farewell to Darwin, or should we continue to use Darwin and even elevate Darwin's ideas in society today? An alternative is to get rid of Darwin's theory altogether in the social sciences and humanities. Why do we need it? Darwin wasn't a social scientist. Darwin had ideas about people, about societies, especially in his book, The Descent of Man. But these ideas have been very controversial throughout the history of evolutionary thinking. Does one need to be a Darwinist to promote evolutionary theory? Once trans-evolutionary change is allowed into the conversation, alternative ways to describe change over time and to explore how people make decisions that lead to actions becomes possible. Most things that can be rolled out can also be traveled across. Why not evolution? Trans-evolutionary change is a category of change that happens at different time and space scales than evolution. It happens above, under, over, around, or through evolutionary theories. It takes place in the Anthropocene period. Trans-evolutionary change is not reducible to an externalist Darwinian process. It involves minds, which means internalism is also involved. One example of this is the new extended mind hypothesis of the last 20 years. The mind extends from inside to outside. This internalist notion is similar to what Wallace coined human selection in 1890. You can investigate trans-evolutionary change at both the individual and social levels, the personal and society. And these levels can be investigated simultaneously interactively and proportionally. Trans-evolutionary change is dedicated to intentional, willful, directed, purposeful, i.e. Tele teleological change. The key seems to be that trans-evolutionary thinkers have more confidence in people to make decisions which lead to actions. Trans-evolutionary change clears the way for discussions of human tension and human extension, which is an alternative type of change to evolutionary theory. Extension goes back to the original terms of origin and change, and then a person can ask, 
What is it that extends? Or where am I extending? How am I extending? Transevolutionary change answers the question if there are alternatives to evolutionism that aren't simply young earth creationism. Transevolutionary change offers a way to talk about change over time that isn't simply biblical literalism. BioLogos is one example of an evangelical Christian organization that focuses on this topic. However, there's a problem with BioLogos because they accept both evolutionism on the one hand and creationism on the other. Since they call themselves theistic evolutionists, they accept evolutionism. So they're the one institution which is in some sense trying to have their cake, evolutionary theory, the consensus in biology, and at the same time promote their ideology, which is creationism. They would like to have both at the same time. Ideists are interested in being accepted in the scientific community because their theory is strictly scientific. However, most of the scientific community reject the scientificity of intelligent design theory. Some people just strangely seem to want to talk about evolution when the actual topic is trans-evolutionary change. So to open up a new discussion of trans-evolutionary change is really to revolutionize the dialogue. The alternative to evolution in the social sciences and humanities does already exist, though some people might wish to dismiss it. The alternative is human extension, and we don't have to question whether or not it exists, because it already does. Transevolutionary change responds to this notion that there's an essential tension within science, philosophy, and theology, or worldview. And the case of evolution is one of the most blatant examples where there can be conflict if people bring their ideology or their worldview to the table when discussing. Can we produce a social science of trans-evolutionary change that doesn't always turn back to this notion of conflict and struggle and fighting and competition? What if there's an alternative that's more interested in tension, in cooperation, in teamwork? Not to avoid conflict and avoid competition, but to show that there's more than one way. One example of this is the idea of mutual aid, or zaimopomash. This was an alternative to the Darwinian approach, which was based on the Victorian notion of survival of the fittest by Herbert Spencer, Thomas Hobbes, the war of all against all, the battle red in tooth and claw. This was the Victorian. This was the Anglo-American view of evolutionary theory that required conflict. Instead, trans-evolutionary change looks at a different scale, looks at a different time, and it says we don't only have to think in terms of struggle for life, survival of the fittest, and competition for someone to beat someone else. Mutual aid is also an important component of change over time. And in human societies, we need to put more focus on this and less on war-oriented ideologies.